Well, good evening, Ren, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, our lockdown lecture Zoom series. This is our 30th meeting, Bren, and I'm delighted that you are all with us this evening. I can always remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidance on Zoom meetings to keep your videos on, please, uh, and have a name there. Uh, if your bandwidth drops out, just drop me a little message, Bren. Thank you very much. Uh, it gives me the greatest of pleasure to invite a, a very good friend uh, of Lodge Hope, uh, who's supported these lockdown lectures from day one. Uh, albeit I was slightly worried he wasn't going to support this evening as he was having uh, a challenge getting in. And it's a great pleasure to have Brother Bob Potter uh, with us. He's a past master of Lodge Kirk Newton and Ratho 85, and he's a past master of our sister research lodge, Lodge Pioneer, who we've heard about during these uh, lockdown lecture series. Uh, he's a past provincial grand chaplain in Wernlithgowshire, and he's only a senior grand chaplain in the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Uh, and I think one of the things, he, he's a very charitable type of brother, as many of us are, and he's a past member and chairman of the Friends of Sir James Mackay House in Edinburgh for 13 years. Uh, and I know recently he does a lot with the Seagull Trust, and I think some of the work that he's been doing over the last few weeks, down drains and everything, is above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, but with that, Brother Bob, can I hand over to you and give you a warm welcome on behalf of the Bern and visitors to Lodge Hope of Karachi. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, good evening, brethren. Can I just check that uh, I did share my screen. I just want to know that uh, maybe Gordon can tell yep. me. Yeah, we can see that, the front screen, yeah. With the Lodge logo on it um, and the title page. Yes, that's on. That's fine. Okay, here we go. Uh, first of all, I would uh, start off by saying that this presentation is my own opinions and research. It's not the opinion of Lodge Kirk Newton and Ratho or any other organisation. If there's one good thing that has come out of this awful COVID-19 pandemic, it is the increased opportunity to carry out our Masonic research and attend lectures in the digital environment all over the world. And as Gordon Mickey reg regularly states, our daily Masonic advancement. I had commenced gathering information about the origins and history of our Mother Lodge several years ago, and I've presented similar lectures to this quite a few times now, updating as we go along. This presentation is another work in progress report of the origins and facts that I've come to light about my home village and particularly my Mother Lodge. Move it. As this is an international audience, uh, first of all, need to give you some understanding and a geographical perspective of where the lodge is located. Lodge Carnuton and Ratho is located in Ratho Village, which is about eight miles west of Edinburgh, on a small hill, approximately 100 metres above sea level. And as you can see, it's a stone's throw away from the capital of Scotland, Edinburgh Castle, Arthur Seat. And Ratho is a very popular area to live and for commuting. It is only a few miles from Edinburgh Airport. The lower picture is looking northwards towards Fife. And as you can see, the three bridges over the River Forth. From the map on the right, you can see that Kirk Newton and Ratho were in the vicinity of the origins of Freemasonry. Let's first consider Ratho Church, a splendid 12th century stone building built by the Mason skillful craftsman. Professor David Stevenson in his books on the origin of Freemasonry in the early lodges makes several references to medieval lodges associated with the construction of great churches. This is particularly true with Ratho Parish Church, whose records date back to 1243 and it was dedicated to St Mary on the 5th of May that year. This record is recorded in the pontificate, which is kept in the National Library of France. However, the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland, Historic Scotland and many other UK organisations state that the building originated in the 12th century and stood for some time on this site 
prior to its dedication to the Virgin Mary. The, the 1793 parish st statistical account records that a well near the church that supplies a copious stream of pure water was likewise consecrated and bears the name of Ladies' Well. This well still exists and is in the grounds of the adjacent mansion house, Rattle Hall, which was built in 1800 for the manager of the local distillery. Yes, Rattle had a distillery at one point. Masons, marks and signs are found all over the church. Note the Gothic style windows, the peaked roofs, which was characteristic and classic architecture of that period. This is also evident in Hatton House, as we'll see later. It's a medieval cruciform church with later added aisles, the east side dated 1683 and the south 1830. There are numerous arches, some with keystones around the building. In the graveyard, there are several interesting headstones and its greatest oddity is a panelled coffin formed from a single stone, a gravestone to William Mitchell, who died in 1749, age 80. He was a mason by trade, a preacher of the gospel, and a gra the gravestone was cut out many years before he died. To put this into perspective, Ratto Church was originally constructed around the same era as the abbeys at Holyrood, Kilwinning and Melrose in the Kirk of Calder, as well as many other churches around Scotland, and decades before the great battles, such as the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297. Also note the beautiful black velvet pulpit pall with the golden embroidered insignia, IHS, which was gifted by Lodge Kirk Newton and Ratho number 85, along with two magnificent vases in 1961 during the bicentenary of the Lodge. In the 1793 statistical account, it also describes that from the top of the South Platte Hill, which is immediately above the manse, can point out 14 different counties. Some assert that parts of 16 counties, making one half of Scotland can be seen from that spot. Remnants of the Templar encampments on the Platte Hill have been part of archeological investigations over the years. And this aligns with the relics placed around the church. A Dr. Ross, while on a visit to the church, with other members of the Scottish Ecclesiological Society in October 1913 said, here and there in the outer wall, genuine Norman history is quite visible, but the only piece of detail now remaining exposed is about a quarter of the width of the west doorway in the south wall. Additionally, on the east wall of the chancel, is a portion of one of these rare and beautiful consecration crosses, which likewise speaks of a medieval building. Note the session clerk's lodge at the entrance gate. Is this the site of the preparation shed and perhaps the first lodge of Rattle? In the south porch is a 13th century tomb slab belonging to one of the Knights Templars who reputedly owned Rattle in the Middle Ages. In 1930, Alterations and restoration work was carried out on the fabric under the care of a Dr. James Lumsden, who was minister from 1917 to 1941, and we remembered as the pilot who guided the church successfully through its greatest and most difficult restoration period. It was during his ministry that the church hall was built at a cost of £6,000. This was a monetary gift to the church from a Mr. William Whitelaw of Hatton House, who also figured prominently in the church. The plaque on the wall of the Session Clerk's Lodge is in memory of this great benefactor, who is also the grandfather of the 1990s MP William Whitelaw. After this work was completed, a Mr. William C.P. Brown, a native of Rathall, also gifted a carpet, a lectern, elders' chairs, and a baptismal font. The, the communion table, which was renewed at this time, is said to be made of Dalmahoy wood. Dr. James Longton was a mason, 
and a member of Lodge Kirk Newton and Rathlow number 85, as well as being the chaplain and the senior grand chaplain of the provincial grand lodge of Linlisconshire during that time. William C.P. Brown and William Whitelaw of Hatton were active Masons too, and both members of 85. <clears throat> Why would Templars build an encampment on the Platte Hill at Rathlow? A theory exists amongst others, not necessarily Masonic, regarding the natural placement of three major prominences in the Lothian's sacred landscape. They are all recognised Neolithic sites, Cairn Papal Hill, Arthur Seat and Traprain Law, which are equidistant at 29 kilometres. The elevation above sea level descends towards the east and the three sites are intricately woven together in an annual astronomical light show. Some may say it's divine intervention. I think we may have some divine intervention happening there. I think we might have lost Bob. As the sites do have a commanding view over the central belt of Scotland and has clear military advantage. Cairn Papal Hill is very close to the Tafikin Preceptory, found in the 11th century. And you can easily conclude why the Platte Hill would be an ideal place for a Templar's encampment, particularly to view the burning beacons, signifying all's well to the east and to the west. The question has often arisen regarding the origin of the name of Lodge Kirk Newton and Rathel. While there is no definite knowledge on this matter, it is probable that the Lodge was first named Rathel at the building of St Mary's Parish Church. It is highly likely that an operative lodge would have been constituted in the shed where the stone would be dressed and the timbers prepared for the erection of the church. The craftsmen would open the lodge, enter apprentices, advance them as they progress to fellow craft and then to master masons when they would put their mark on their work. During the years of construction, many apprentices and other members were admitted along with some who undoubtedly decided to remain in the village to carry on the building and other works around the village. The barony of Rathel, or Radchew as it was then known, came into the possession of the Stuart of Scotland when he married the daughter of Robert Bruce, who gave it with her marriage. When King Robert II, the son of that marriage, ascended to the throne in 1371, Ratho and the whole of the lands were given to his son James the Stuart. In 1377, Alan de Lauder, who was also the keeper of Tantallon Castle, purchased the estate of John de Hatton, the purchase being ratified by Robert II as Baron of Ratho. In the next century, entries made in Edinburgh on the 2nd of July 1453 records an allowance by the King, James II, for the wages and the expenses of masons and carpenters present at the Towers of Halton, or Hatton House. An early written proof of masons' activity in a lodge 567 years ago. Later in the 16th century, Hatton House in the parish of Carnewton was constructed and most likely an operative lodge would be formed there too. Descendants of the Ratho Lodge would no doubt be employed in the construction of Hatton House. The parishes of Ratho and Cutneaton being inextricably linked as they still are today. The construction works described definitely span the construction of the Ratho and Cutneaton churches, Hatton House and the constitution of Lodge Cutneaton and Ratho. As an obvious result of these activities and facts is, this could be a reasonable conjecture to the established lodge title of Kirk Newton and Rathel. A long time before the granting of a charter, 
in the history of Grand Lodge of Scotland, excluding the lodges that have acquired the, the name Kilwinning in their name. Kirk Newton and Ratho are one of a few lodges to be named after two locations where they operate. This is an 18th century map that I've used to demonstrate the dates of the construction activities, all within an approximate three mile radius of Ratho. The boundary between Linlithgowshire and Edinburghshire is the, the River Ammon, highlighted in blue. And for those watching in black and white, it's next to the Red Roads. The Masons all took Mason's works all took place between the arterial roads, or the tracks, as they were then, to Glasgow, to Lanark, and to Kilmarnock. And nobody could have passed Burn Wind without noticing the magnificent splendour of Hatton House Mansion. I would estimate that the amount of work would linearly increase if this radius is increased likewise. Therefore, by the time we get to the lodge being chartered in 1761, there has obviously been a considerable amount of work for the Masons to operate their trade, and perhaps a bit away from the influence of any big tune burgesses or masters of works. It is entirely possible that the Masons walked from Ratho to Hatton to carry out their craft and Mason work. It would only take about half an hour. There is a recognised path from the village up past the quarry through the Termain Wood and Craw Hill Wood, a path that I as a youngster from the village have explored many a time. It is worth also noting that the churches that surround Ratho are all named St Mary's. In Ratho we have St Mary's Parish Church, St Mary's Chapel in Wilkeson Road, St Mary's Episcopal Church at Dalmahoy, and St Mary's Parish Church in Cap Newton. Can I also draw your attention to Clifton Hall, circled in red here, which was built in 1850, which is now a private fee-paying school. At one time was the residence of one brother, Sir Alexander Charles Maitland Gibson Maitland, the seventh provincial Grand Master of Stirlingshire. The village of Ratho evolved from the local industries of farming and quarrying, and most likely in those days consisted of a single street emanating from the church, originally constructed in the 12th century. Ratho Local History Group recorded that in 1763 there were 10 houses, and in 1860 there were two streets, Main Street and Ludgate. Ludgate means Lordsgate in Old Scots, and that street ran from the east end of the main street towards the church. Ludgate has been renamed Baird Road in the early 19th century after Hugh Baird, the engineer that designed and built the Union Canal, which was opened in 1822. The slide shows the actual charter issued by the Grand Lodge of Scotland on the 3rd of August 1761. It's a very old and interesting document, and the parts relating to the lodge name read, to all and sundry, to whose knowledge these present shall come greeting, where upon application to the Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons for the Kingdom of Scotland by William Christie Master, James Rule and John Muir Wardens, John and William Tarbucks, Stewards, and John Graham Secretary, and others brethren of a lodge of Freemasons held at Kirk Newton and Ratho, praying that the Grand Lodge would grant warrant for expediting a charter under their seal, erecting the petitioners into a regular lodge of free and accepted Masons by the title and designation of the Lodge of Kirk Newton and Ratho. The Grand Lodge accordingly granted warrant for expeding the underwritten patent of constitution and new erection in the petitioner's favours. Know ye therefore that the most worshipful Grand Master of Scotland and the Grand Lodge thereof aforesaid have constituted, erected and appointed, and hereby constitute, erect and appoint the worshipful brethren above named 
and their successors in all time coming to be true and regular lodge of free and accepted masons by the title of the lodge of Kirtnewton and Rathal and appoint and ordain all regular lodges to hold and respect them as such, hereby giving, granting and committing to them their successors full power and authority to meet, assemble and convene as a regular lodge and to admit and receive apprentices past fellow crafts and raised master masons upon payment of such composition for support of their lodge, as they shall see convenient, and to elect and choose masters and wardens and other officers annually, or otherwise as they shall have occasion, recommending to the brethren aforesaid and their successors to reverence and obey their superiors in all things lawful, honest, as becomes the honour and harmony of masonry. The charter then records the receipt of a fee of two guineas, the place and date of issue being Mary's Chapel, Edinburgh, signed by Levin, Grand Master. The Grand Master was the most watchable brother David Leslie, the eighth Earl of Levin, and the fifth Earl of Melville, who was Grand Master Mason from 1759 to 1761. The combined lodge title, the Lodge of Kirtnewton and Rattle, the title and designation recognises that the lodge did operate in at least two locations. Further research from the early minute books confirms that the lodge did meet in a number of other locations too. The raw camps in East Calder, Mid Calder and New Liston to name but a few. Hatton House, described by Historic Scotland was a Scottish baronial mansion set in parklands with extensive estates in the vicinity of Rattle. The extended Hatton House was built in the late 17th century by Charles Maitland, who subsequently became the Earl of Lauderdale. The house was the seat of the Lauderdales from 1682 to 1792. In 1870, the estate was acquired by the Earl of Morton, who passed it to his son, Lord Aberdour. In more recent times, the house belonged to William Whitelaw, a great ambassador of the 20th century British transport system and the chairman of the London and North Eastern Railway. Hatton House was one of the great Renaissance houses of Scotland, expanded from an original tower and later Renaissance courtyard by Lord Charles Maitland, the brother of the Duke of Lauderdale. It was originally L-shaped and became a great rectangular mansion, circular towers on each corner. Its main tower was turned into an enormous balustraded viewing platform. Its surrounding policies were equally imposing, parterres, formal gardens and wilderness, some traces of which including the OG roofs, pavilions at each end still remain. Most splendid survival is the magnificent winged gates. Note the main access gate was not where you'd expect it to be, but through a gate further east near the home farm or Hatton Mains farm, along a Roman style roadway, some of which is still visible if you drive carefully along the A71 Kilmarnock Road at Hatton Bridge Cottages. The other access is the one you see just set back before Kirk Newton, the turn off to Kirk Newton on the A71 near Wilkeson. It is inscribed 1692 on the keystone of the main arch. A stone pineapple decorated the arch gates, but the east one has since disappeared. The back of the gateway records the relocation day of 1829. The two gate piers heavily rusticated in alternate courses, bear the Lauderdale arms and are buttressed to the rear. These were built for John, the fifth Earl of Lauderdale, as part of the Grand Eastern approach to the Lion Gate and the forecourt of Hatton House. Hatton House had many names, Argyle House as it was once mistakenly entitled, with a walled garden to the south comprising two terraces with a central pond on the upper terrace, being ornamented with a pavilion 
formal beds are indicated either side of the pool. The lower terrace also had a central pond with formal beds either side. The walls are shown supporting espalier fruit trees, the south terrace wall with gazebos and a bathhouse which dates from 1670, the summer house dated 1704. The mansion main access was through a small entrance hall panelled in oak brought from Leatheringham Abbey in Suffolk and then into the main hall which was 50 feet by 20 feet oak panelled and also with a magnificent finely made Jacobean plaster ceiling. The 1793 parish statistical account states by the Reverend James Robertson describes the estate of Hatton as being nearly equal in value and extent to half of the parish and adds that the principal seat at Hatton is a venerable old house with extensive gardens surrounded with large plantations and enclosures of at least 800 acres of ground. Hatton House has four floors and 50 bedrooms, not including the servants' quarters, and was said to have walls 10 feet thick and a secret stairway. It was reckoned to be the finest house in Lothians, west of Edinburgh at that time. Hatton House was unfortunately destroyed by a fire on the 25th of February 1952 and raced to the ground in 1955. The terrace wall, bathhouse, the pavilions along with the garden house and the south gates are all that remains of Hatton House today. Moving forward to the constitution and recognition of Curtin and Ratho as a regular lodge, in the, the Scottish Masonic Records preface, page 5, it states, It is not known with any certainty when Grand Lodge of Scotland first assigned numbers to the lodges in a row. The first minute books her daughter lodges were referred to by their names, and it is not until we come to the fourth minute book of Grand Lodge that we find that lodges are referred to by numbers. Lodge Carnewton and Ratho appears first to have carried the number 109 in the early years of Grand Lodge. In 1816 it was given the number 84. In 1822 the number 80. Then in 1826, 85, which remains the current number. It must be noted that as previously described, their charter does not make any reference to a roll number whatsoever. The old lodge was gifted to the Masons by James Maitland, the 8th Earl of Lauderdale in 1793. In this picture, which was taken in 1961, the lodge is on the top flat above the butcher shop and is accessed by means of the outside stained stair shown on the right. The stone carving above the eaves has been reported as the Lauderdale coat of arms and is still present today. There have been some 18 Earls of Lauderdale and the majority have lived in Hatton House. The third Earl of Lauderdale, also known as Lord Hatton, being the Scotland secretary to King Charles II, was something of an adversary to brother Sir Robert Murray. Murray used to write updates to the King during his travels and included political sections in invisible ink and was concerned Lauderdale would conveniently forget this in favour of his own moderate political views. Murray was at pains to ensure that when Lauderdale saw his mason's mark, the pentacle, it would remind him of the secret messages that had to be passed to the king. Inside the old lodge building, this is a view of the east, again in 1961. It was quite small but elevated and grand the master's dais altar and secretary's table and still in use today, and not the mural behind the master's chair. I'll come back to that a wee while. The Lithgow Gazette reported on the 12th of March 1934, a ceremony of great historic importance at the old Masonic Lodge, Kirk Newton and Rathway 85, when its seal made in 1781, which had been lost for 125 years, 
and just recovered was restored to the lodge's possession. The fact that the lodge had had such an instrument was not known to the present generation until a chance discovery by the secretary, brother Hugh McGilvery, past master, while collecting material for a history of the lodge. That he came upon a reference to the seal in a minute written in October 1809. He immediately set himself a task to find it, and 22 years later, it was accomplished. It is not known in the early, it is now known in the early 1800s. The lodge issued its own diplomas written on vellum, which, on which the impress of the ceiling and wax on a ribbon was affixed. When Grand Lodge later started to supply diplomas, the lodge seal was misplaced. At the same time, during 1934, a framed and large copy of the impression of the seal, painted by the daughter of the master at that time, Brother Dixon Scott, was presented to the lodge. The inset picture in the top right is a mirror image of the actual seal as it stands today. Again, reported in the Gazette in November 1935, on that occasion, the honorary membership of the lodge was confirmed on Brother William Whitelaw, present proprietor of Hatton, the ancient seat of Lauderdales and chairman of the early ER. Brother Whitelaw, for more than a generation, has been a mighty force in the land, shaping the destinies for the British race and business, especially in the realm of transport systems, in the church and other branches of life. Brother Whitelaw, also had a special interest in a wall painting, presumed to be that of James VIII, Earl of Lauderdale, in Masonic dress, which was uncovered in a good state of condition during alteration. Further research identifies that that painting was destroyed by rainwater, which was seeping through from the dem demolition of an adjacent building behind the lodge in 1959. As I stated earlier, Brother Whitelaw was also a generous supporter of the church and the memorial plaque that exists today in the session clerk's lodge at the church gates reads, to the glory of God and grateful memory of William Whitelaw of Hatton, died 19th of January 1946, who presented the parish with a hall in the year 1929 and through whose efforts and generous restoration of this church was accomplished in the year 1932. He was an esteemed as a dear, dear believer in God and enduring work for the church throughout his life. A week later in the Gazette, on the 29th of November, the latest embellishment to be added to the lodge are a master's desk, wardens and wardens pedestals and an altar, all of oak bearing in ornate carvings, the emblems of the craft. These were gifted by Brother William C.P. Brown, a founder member of Lodge Hart of Midlothian 832 and a well-known director of Hart of Midlothian Football Club and the proprietor of Ingleston Estate. Brother Brown is a native of Ratho and was initiated into the mysteries of Freemasonry in Lodge Cup Newton and Ratho some 40 years before in 1895. When Brother Brown rose to hand over the gifts, his mind naturally reverted back through the years to his childhood, the time when as a lad he romped about the Ratho Brace, carefree with other carefree local companions. This lodge furniture is still in use and enjoyed by all. This picture shows the office bearers during the 175th anniversary of the lodge in 1935. This is a picture of the office bearers during the bicentenary year, 1961. Sadly, none of these brethren are still alive today. The last surviving brother passed away in November 2019, Brother George Tyler, past master. He was 72 years a mason when he died. Here we can see the brethren commencing the bicentenary Masonic parade down the main street, past the old lodge to the church. The village residents turned out a great number and lined the streets. As the bicentenary parade approached the church, the brethren were instructed 
eyes to the left as they were passing the war memorial. The Bible bearer that day was a brother, Andrew Wallace, who held that office until 1979, when he demitted the office to a young potter taking up his first office in the lodge. Note for the engineers present, the old gasworks and the chimney in the background, which privately manufactured coal gas from 1856 to 1926. The bicentenary service drew a very large assembly of brethren from all over Scotland, and they had to queue up to enter St Mary's Parish Church that day. The brother second from the right is none other than my father, Brother Sanders Potter, who became the Lodge Deputy Master during my first term in office in 1989. The only office that he held in the Lodge. Here we can see the Masonic Parade perfectly, parade perfectly marshalled by Brother Ernie Laurie, back up Baird Road through the village after the service and to the skirl of the pipes of the Whitrig Colliery Pipe Band. In the background is Ratho Hall to the west of the church that they may, we mentioned where Mary's Well is situated, or Ladies' Well. The bicentenary dinner took place after the rededication at the Lodge on the 28th of October 1961. The dinner was held in Kirtliston. There are some interesting extracts from the toast to the Lodge given at the dinner by Brother Sir Andrew Murray of Canning Gate co-winning number two, who was a past right honourable Lord Provost of Edinburgh. And he stated, in 1761, when 200 years ago our country was still smarting from the permanent adjournment of the Scottish Parliament, and let me say it, the betrayal of Scotland's national independence. 1761, when those that met as brethren in the lodge room at Ratho might well have seen the arrival of the young Chevalier at Holyrood, or heard the sound of the cannon of the Jacobite rebellion, or even met the young prince in his vanguard at Kirkliston on the 11th of September. Most worshipful Grand Master Mason, 1761 is the date to which we are entitled by extant minute to direct our minds, but a wider thought and something more definite than imagination takes us back to Scotland in the 13th century, back over the reign of Charles II and the rule over Scotland by the Royal Commissioners, the Earls of Middleton, Rothes and Lauderdale, back beyond the time of the Covenanters, back beyond the time of Lord James Stuart and the Earl of Bothwell, the tragic Mary Queen of Scots, back before Flodden and Bannockburn, back to the golden age of Alexander III, back to the 13th century over events and touching distinguished persons linked in history with Rathal, Hatton House and Carnewton, back to the shed where the timbers were prepared and the stone dressed where the master masons put their mark on their work. It is a glorious thought, wonderful and inspiring, that tonight we can look back, not over two centuries of time, but directly back over seven centuries of time, to the true source from which has flowed our Masonic stream of life. The claim by Brother Murray in 61 was of course that the, the lodge at Kirk Newton and Rathal albeit an operative lodge, existed centuries before the year of the Charter. This is a splendid picture of all the Kirk Newton and Rathal members, the Provincial Grand Lodge of Lothgoshire and the Grand Lodge of Scotland attending the 250th rededication meeting, which included two brothers, Ernie and Duncan Greenock, who had travelled all the way from Perth, Australia, to attend this event in their mother lodge. A young mason in the middle in the crimson of the middle row is my son Robert who was born when I was in the chair the first time and he followed in his grandfather's footsteps and was the deputy master during my third and fourth terms as master in 2010-2011. The grand director of ceremonies was first to arrive that day some two and a half hours before the ceremony was due to commence and he was none other than Brother William Ramsey McGee. And what a fine day was had by all. Lodge Kirk Newton and Rathal 
is a rural lodge and one of 19 lodges in the provincial Grand Lodge of Lomithgoshire. We were very proud when our past master brother Bob Scott was commissioned as the provincial Grand Master in 2011 to 2016. The first ever 85 member to hold that rank. Let's now consider that I believe to be unique about the lodge. It is our carved stone mural inserted in the wall in the east of the lodge. In 1970, the old lodge, with, along with the adjacent properties, were compulsory purchased by the then Midlothian County Council, as many of the adjacent buildings were in poor condition and were ready to collapse. The lodge had to relocate in a very relatively short time. Thankfully, a nearby property became available and the lodge then purchased the old Baptist Kirk some 50 metres away. And the stone mural, which is in four parts, was carefully rescued and installed into the east wall of the new premises. As we prepared for our 250th anniversary, my then to be son-in-law brother Mark Nevin, a world champion painter and decorator, carried out the restoration of the mural. You must agree that Brother Nevin, who is now our immediate past master, did a fantastic job and his work drew great attention of many eminent Freemasons during their celebrations and rededication by the Grand Lodge of Scotland, none of which had come across such a unique monument to the craft. There is no evidence that Kirk Newton and Ratho ever used floor cloths but the mural is carved entirely from stone and depicts, in my view, as one of the earliest representations of a tracing board. It would be interesting to hear if any other brother has come across a similar item in their travels. This is a closer shot of the stone mural and shows numerous Masonic emblems and is dated 1787, which coincides with the early period and introduction of tracing boards in the 18th century. Most of the emblems that you would expect are present and they're common in our tracing boards of today. It's square, oblong or rectangular, parallel plate or cube, pillars at the entrance, three columns that support the lodge, the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian, the headed by the sun, the moon, and the master of the lodge. The working tools, the square pavement, the volume of the sacred law, cable tool, Brother Love, a sundial, and the Lion's Gate are all there too. Likewise, an ear of corn near to a fall of running water, and the master in the middle chamber, adorned with a jewel, a copy of the jewel worn by the first Grand Master of Scotland. This has to be quite unique, brethren, unless you can advise otherwise. In conclusion, the baronial history of Ratho, the 12th century church, the magnificent 14th century Hatton House, the proximity to Edinburgh, the geography and the traditions evolved and still being employed today. I don't think there's any doubt that an operative lodge was indeed practising in Kirk Newton and Ratho and the surrounding areas well before the constitution of the lodge and it being chartered in 1761. Further research is undoubtedly required, but I believe the Masons from Kirk Newton and Ratho have more likely been involved in the development and the evolution of Edinburgh and surrounding areas for centuries. The local quarries supplied the materials and the masons will have assisted with the construction. My father, who spent most of his working life in the Craig Park and Bray Head quarries as a mason and a curb dresser, like his predecessors, were regularly called into Edinburgh to carry out repairs to stonework and roadways in the Royal Mile the old and new towns, especially after the growing number of road traffic accidents in the late 20th century. In the early minute books that exist of our lodge, and I viewed them myself in Grand Lodge archives, each brother attended would sign the minute book and pay his dues. There was no separate attendance book, and the lodge had one official meeting on St John's Day, occasionally meeting on Christmas Day. We also had the issue back in those days that not many people had any formal education outside the big towns and most probably couldn't read or write. There was no need for them to. 
work and survival being the highest priority locally. You can well imagine that the Burley Masons from the quarries around Cut Newton and Rathrow would be more interested in the toddy than that being able to sit down and write up notes of a lodge meeting. The earliest minute we have is the 11th of November 1791, but we do know that the lodge applied for a charter early in 1761, which was then granted on the 3rd of August. The charter itself records the names of the master wardens, the stewards and the secretary, and the Grand Lodge members attending the Grand Lodge communication that granted the charter. The charter is the only record that we have of that event, perhaps the oldest record in the possession of the lodge. And no doubt, lots of bits of paper and records have been lost along the way. The only other lodge in the old Lithgowshire County chartered by Grand Lodge at that time was Ancient Brazen No. 17 at Linlithgow in 1736. We have no information of 85 being connected with a provincial Grand Lodge at that time, although records do exist in Laurie's history of Freemasonry of Ancient Brazen being attached to the provincial Grand Lodge of Stirlingshire. The Provincial Grand Lodge of Linlithgowshire was erected with nine lodges, some of which that no longer exist, unfortunately. And some 60 years later, they were formed in 1827. However, considering all that's been said, you can see the proximity to the lodge, the origins in Freemasonry, and we can all make up our own conclusions regarding our history. Finally, I hope that maybe one day after we come out of this pandemic, that some of you brethren will come and visit us and see the stone mural for yourself. You will be made most welcome indeed. I must thank Brother Gordon Mickey, the master of Hope of Karachi 337, for inviting me to present this lecture to your regular weekly digital meetings. The Tuesday evenings have been graced by so many eloquent and learned speakers, none more so than the excellent presentation last week by Brother Dr. Mike Kerrosley, and we are looking forward to Brother Tony Harvey next week. They are, of course, both renowned Prestonian lecturers. And I have to say it's the first time that a Rathonian has ever been propped up by two Prestonians. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Thank you, Brother. Well, Brother Bob Potter, you have certainly marked well this evening. And I'm sure all the locals that are supporting you this evening will have seen that young boy's done awfully well the night. And uh, your family tradition within the lodge and you being a local to Rato, uh, you'll have made them all very, very proud. Uh, so, Bob, on behalf of the members of Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our visitors, thank you so much for giving us such an insight into what many would probably have just thought was a, a small rural lodge on the outskirts of Edinburgh, and that's where all the history was, but you've certainly proven them all wrong this <coughs> evening. And I do hope many of us will take up your very kind offer to come along, and I'll sure, I'm sure I'll manage to find a driver the night I come across as well, because uh, Brother Bob Scott is due me a drink or two, I'm sure. Bob, we've got a few mm -hmm. questions in the chat for you. Uh, And I think the, the, the first question is not specific to your lodge, but I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to answer it. It's from uh, Brother Ron Mann. Uh, why the changes of the lodge numbers? I don't know. That's a question the Grand Lodge can answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have no idea why. They, I, I, can only, um, I can only surmise or imagine that there was a uh, representations of uh, in question and antiquity of various lodges at the time. Yeah, there is, there is a comment in Draffin's records book and I will copy that later on this evening and put it up in the Facebook chat for you. Uh, so David Brown's asking, the seal shows the number 85, but the previous slide said that it didn't bear this number until 1826. Would the number have been added to the 1761 seal later? Uh, I'd need to check when the seal actually came about. Um, the minute that um, Hugh McGilvery found was dated 1809. So uh, just need to 
need to check the dates why that actually is. Yeah. Interesting point. I'm sorry I can't even fully answer that. Okay, no. Apart from that, my head's minced the new. There's a comment from Bob Phillips. Very interesting lecture. Particularly, as I noticed in a photograph, one of my distant relatives, past master William Pollock, uh -huh. as a past master of Lodge Collington and Curry, Kurt Newton and Ratho being a founder lodge, I wonder if the Pollocks mentioned on the Ratho War Memorial were members of the lodge. Um, I personally know I checked that about him, but the Pollocks are uh, local to the village and they're farmers um, uh, down towards uh, Elkis, uh, Ingleson near the airport and uh, they're still around. Uh, uh, the youngest Pollock, who I don't believe is a member of the craft, uh, plays at the bowling club in Rathal. Um, I, would, I would assume yes, most likely. Absolutely, most likely, but it's not something that I've checked up. Okay. Uh, the, the next question <coughs> is uh, a question that is very close to my own mother lodge's heart as well, Lodge Errol Haig, uh, because we also had a compulsory purchase order uh, put on us by Fife Council. Uh, so if you're ever driving to leaving Bern, uh, you're actually driving over our old building as you go past Windigates. So the question from Aubrey over in Chile uh, to you, Bob, is could nothing have been done to prevent the demolition of the lodge building? Um, as I wasn't around at that particular time, uh, Gordon, uh, probably, I don't know exactly, but by reading the, the history of the village, uh, there was, the adjacent buildings were not well looked after and uh, they were actually falling down. And uh, I did mention that uh, the demolition of another building to the rear actually caused an ingress of water, which actually destroyed the picture of the Earl of Lauderdale. Um, so I, 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 I can, again, I can only surmise that the council were having to act before half the street fell into the road. Yeah, I think it's tragic when you see this, but unfortunately it needs must at times. Tragic, tragic, absolutely tragic. Okay. Charles Stewart's got a comment, Bob, uh, a fascinating talk which dovetailed with a programme earlier in the week about Ham House and the connection between two of the Earls of Lauderdale, Hatton and Ratho. Uh, I'm sure Charles will be able to put up in the chat what program, what station that was on, so people can find it on whatever iPlayer or TV system that they may have at home. Uh, lots of excellence, very informative. Thank you, well done. Uh, Archie Chalmers, thank you for an enjoyable insight into your wee village lodge, well presented. Thank you. So David McLaughlin, a Master Mason of 1587. Excellent lecture. Lots of time spent on research and fruits of your labour shown tonight. May I add that it is one of the friendliest lodges I know of, and there is always a very warm welcome with a great harmony after the meeting. Well done, Bob. Thank you, David. I'll give you that five or later. <laughs> <laughs> a detailed presentation of a real Masonic gem. So Ian McIntosh, a, a resident... Uh, historian all things Jacobean. In 1799, with the introduction of the Unlawful Societies Act, the independent lodges had to come under the authority of Grand Lodge. Mother Kilwinning and all the Kilwinning lodges, etc., had to be slotted into the numbering list according to their seniority. A few renumberings took place at the beginning of the 19th century. So, Brother Ron Mann, that's a answer to, to your question that you posed at the top of the, the questions and answer session. Uh, Brother Bob, a very interesting and informative talk. Having visited 85 during Brother Mark Nevin's year in the chair, I was much impressed by the lodge room and where I was made extremely welcome. Uh, so Joseph uh, Rodericks is asking, what is the current membership of the lodge? Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I reckon it's about 30, 30 current members. Um, that's one of the things that I didn't actually mention, but I've come across in, in various um, pieces of history about the lodge is that for years and years and years, the, the lodge 
seem to average about 50 members. But I think over the last couple of years, we've, uh, we've dropped in membership. There was a, there was a small hardcore that keep the place running. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've had our ups and downs like every other lodge. Yeah, that tends to happen with the provincial lodges, doesn't it, Bob? There is a, that hardcore membership that just do everything for everyone at the time. Uh, Michael Munro's also commented about the numbering system, uh, about the kill winning lodges. Uh, and I think the, the final point uh, for this evening, it's the last one in the chat, and I think it's very fitting, Bob. Uh, it comes from the other Bob uh, from your mother lodge. Uh, Albeit, I did think you were going to say he was the one who was unique in the lodge. I'm very pleased that it was something different and much older. Uh, the old lodge is still standing. It was found that it was a listed building. And that's the lodge showing in Bob's background. I, as we can see, the stairs uh, to the right-hand side of it. So, I, so that's from uh, your past master and your past provincial grandmaster, Brother Bob Scott. I, so thank you, Bob, for that. Uh, and Ian McIntosh is quickly coming in. Blame it on the French, the French Revolution, and the reason why lodges had to submit lists of members to local authorities and pledge allegiance to king and country. So thank you for that, Ian. Bob, on behalf of all the members of Lodge Hope of Karachi and our visitors this evening, once again, a huge thank you for a very interesting, a very informative and a very local lecture because we've seen so many interesting facts from all around the world. It's lovely to bring it back so close to home. So thank you very much, sir. Brian, looking forward to next week. As the Rathonian said, we, he's, bottleneck, he's bookended by two Prestonian lecturers. And next week we have Brother Tony Harvey, who will present to us about two parallel organisations, Scouting and Freemasonry. Uh, as I said at the top of the show, Brian, uh, can I ask you to go onto the Eventbrite page and just register? The details will be up on the Facebook pages as normal. And uh, we look forward to you all joining us uh, next week. Tomorrow evening, uh, the Grand Lodge of Scotland History and Heritage Group will present uh, another lecture in the series. Uh, and it is Lodge number five tomorrow evening. So that's seven o'clock at a Zoom or a computer near you, Brian. So we look forward to you all joining that. Uh, this evening's lecture will be up on the YouTube channel later on this evening. And I encourage you to go in and have a look please carry on the conversation on our Facebook pages. Brian, thank you very much for joining us. And as usual, I will now try and unmute you all, uh, or if you just want to unmute yourselves and say your thank yous and good nights to Brother Bob Potter. Thank well you, Brian. Done, Bob Potter. Bob, thank well you. Done, Bob. Thoroughly well done, well done, enjoyed well that. Well done, well done, Bob. Well done, Bob. Well done, Bob. Absolutely. Well done, Bob. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Come upstairs and read a story with that. Well done, Bob. Well done, Bob. Perfect. Perfect. Good work. Perfect. 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 Hopefully it does go a lot. Very interesting, Bob. Thanks very much for that. Well done, Bob. See you soon. Thanks, Bob. Nice one. Well done, Bob. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bob. Thanks again, Gordon. Thank you. I like the advert for Tesco's. Okay, Brian, I'm going to give you your normal or tradition now. I'm going to give you five. Well, Thank you, Bob Potter. A lovely evening. Yeah. I'll be five drinks anyway. <laughs> ah, well, you never know, Ronnie. <laughs> uh, hey, is he still well, here? Ah, he's still there. <laughs> Three. Good night. Good night, Bill. One. Good night, Bill.